All right, weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Life Plus God podcast. My name is Alyssa Robinson. I'm your host. And, and uh, today, I'm Doug Meyer. Yep, we got Reverend Doug Meyer, a fellow weirdo, yep, here yep. with us. And uh, we're asking the question, who are the weirdest prophets mm. in the Bible? So I don't know if y'all are aware of all of the stories of the prophets from the Old Testament and all of the ways that God used them, and but there's some pretty crazy stuff in there. Uh, so I wanted to explore some of that today, have a little bit of fun, maybe learn some facts that you didn't maybe know so. before. Maybe, maybe. Uh, but it's funny because, Doug, you know I've been experimenting with ChatGPT and just oh, having yeah. a little bit of fun yeah. with it. Did you do any of this with well, it? Well, I so just out of curiosity, I put into ChatGPT, uh, who are the weirdest prophets yeah. in the Bible? And uh, the response was, it is inappropriate to call prophets weird. And it's disrespectful What's Chad GBT to religion. What's ChatGPT doing getting up on a high horse? I know. So I was like, uh-oh. Well, just I didn't to- <laughs> think it had that kind of internal... Just to clear the Neither. air, we're not trying to hate on the no, prophets for being weird. We say that in the most endearing and loving of terms. But uh, I think that when we start to talk through some of these prophets, you might come to the same realization that Doug and I have, that there's some weird stuff going on. Well, okay, so let's just hold that intention. So back then there were uh, spokespeople for God who were weird. Would you not agree with me that there are currently spokespeople for God who are weird? Yes, but I also question, like, do you think you're a spokesperson for God or are you actually a spokesperson for God? That's where I I get weird. Yeah, I get it. And, um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll play with that because (laughs) I'm like, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, I'm thinking sometimes they were told to go be a prophet. But other times, it's just accumulated um, knowledge, and they just did it, and and society announced that they were a prophet. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and then sometimes God said, "Go tell them this." So well, God decided. Okay. So that's a really good place to start. Actually, okay. what is a prophet? Like, how do we define a prophet as people of faith? Mm-hmm. And have we kind of misinterpreted or misused that word? The um, So the easiest is um, a spokesperson for God who is functioning with what they call divine inspiration. Okay? So I think that's an important clarity because sometimes people say they speak for God, but their inspiration is their own doing Mm -hmm. or their own income or their own manipulation of people or whatever, right? So we have to discern who's inspired by the divine and who's inspired by their ego? Well, I think that that's a fair thing to always put out there. And I asked, uh, I didn't ask, I I dug around and it it seemed like, and this is kind of a, well, uh, if it is in alignment with scripture, and I think that's more of a statement for contemporary prophets because uh, some of the older prophets, there wasn't even established scripture yet. So they couldn't be like, hey, Jeremiah, let me go look that up and see if that, you know, mm-hmm. they weren't doing that. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's motivation and purposes. How do you, what's the litmus test for divine inspiration? Again, is it self-serving or is it God-serving? Uh, some would wonder because some of the things that they were, you know, coming down on people for uh, was pretty hard. Yeah. And so I am sure naysayers in the community were like, no, there goes crazy Jeremiah again. Mm-hmm. Crazy, you know. See, and I've always thought of a prophet to like narrow down the definition even more. Tell yeah. me if I'm wrong. A spokesperson for God who speaks truth to power. Oh, yeah. And that is like a defining characteristic of like, if you are profiting off of your uh, message, or if you are the power, and you're not challenging uh, the powers that be in any way with your message, like you might not be a prophet, you might be part of the problem. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's fair. I think that uh, let's just start out real broad. Spokesperson for God with divine inspiration. Then from that, yeah. they were big time. Like I, um, 
I'm going to read this because this doesn't sound like something I would say. Uh, Their primary role was to make known the holiness of God and the covenant obligations. Here we go. To denounce injustice, idolatry, empty ritualism, and to call God's covenant people, Israel, to repentance and faithfulness. Uh, so frequently, yeah, they de- denounce rampant social injustice and in whatever forms and all the different forms that, um, you know, it was oppressing the poor. Yeah. So. Well, and I think that uh, one of the ways that we sometimes misinterpret the role of prophet is like thinking the, of them as seers or like future mm. tellers as opposed to because they're not like it's hard because a lot of prophets would talk about hey, if you don't turn from the error of your ways, this is the consequence. This is what's going to happen. And then people don't turn from their ways. And that is the consequence. And that is what happens. And so people are like, oh, a prophet can see the future, can see God's plan, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that we're kind of stepping into weird territory when we think of them as the... They know the future. Seers, yeah. yeah. Well, I, somewhere I read that it kind of falls down into like three categories. Uh, a prophet could either be uh, affirming. I don't know if the word would be complimenting. Hey, way to go, guys. You're doing what God asked you to do. Or you better shape up or something bad is going to happen. Or because you've been so bad, this is about to happen. Mm-hmm. So it's the people who see the writing on the wall, visionaries. And sometimes it happens soon. And at other times it was hundreds of years in the future. Yeah. You know, so um, I think it's, uh, I can't imagine being a normal, whatever that would have been person back then and hearing this. And I think I probably would have been a yahoo that was like, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Get on down the road. I don't know. Well, okay. How many prophets are mentioned in oh, the Bible? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Are there? So here's the deal on that. So um, there are what's called major prophets and minor prophets. There are four big guys in the Christian Bible. If you then also include the Talmud, which is all the Jewish writings, the number of prophets goes way up. It's, um, and I thought you would like this because it goes up to fifty-five, seven of which were female. So they get more play in the Talmud than they do in the Bible. We got to pump up those numbers. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Come on, ladies, let's prophesy. Uh, but there are four um, what we call major prophets and then I think 12 minor prophets. But then there are one-offs scattered here and there. But the ones that made the cut for the big book are basically the, the four and 12. So, so who are... Yep. Some of the most unusual prophets we come across in the oh, Bible. Oh, my goodness, y'all. And what do they do? All right. I'm going to give you um, just a high-level overview. And we'll probably stop and gawk every now and yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Isaiah um, walked around prophesying naked. And if we wanted to dig into that, it's it was about... Let me see if I can find it. The vulnerability of the people, then that was what um, that God instructed him to uh, be naked and barefoot. Now, some people then now go, well, he wasn't really naked, naked. What that meant was he wasn't wearing his tunic. So I don't know. You he know, had like a sackcloth. He, he on had or his boxers or on, like a loincloth. Boxers. Yeah. Bible boxers. Yeah. Ooh, we should start a line of the Bible boxers. I don't want to. No. You, you can do it. <laughs> we'll make them out of sackcloth. We won't sell a pair. Okay. Burlap. Then, okay, speaking of underwear, Jeremiah hid his underwear uh, under a rock by the Euphrates River because God told him to. I don't know. You know. So the other one. I guess I just don't understand. I mean, I guess with prophesying naked. And it representing vulnerability. Okay, I can go there. Also, it draws attention. So it probably, like, your message might be getting to more people. Um, So I guess I understand that as an instruction. Like, what was the context around hiding your underwear under a rock and how that glorifies God? Uh, Here's one thing it says. So... um So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopian captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. So perhaps what he was being was an example of, 
hey, straighten up or you'll end up like me walking around naked. Hmm. I don't know. That's Isaiah or? Uh, yeah. Yep, yep, Isaiah. So, so he and he's, he's, he's one of the big guys. He's a, a major. cautionary tale. Yeah, he's a major. Uh, then we all know the story of Jonah, you know, uh, supposedly. Jonah heard what God wanted him to do. Hey, go to Nineveh and tell him this, straighten up. He was like, no, not so much. And he uh, fled the other way, fell out of the boat, lived in the belly of a big fish for a long time, or three days, right? And even then, he was really mad and kind of ticked off and didn't want to go. Was it last year we did the whole series mm-hmm. on Jonah? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, God told him, hey, go over there and proclaim to Nineveh, repent, you know, or get zapped. And he, even then, he only went like halfway across town. In my mind, I hear him going like, hey, straighten up your act. Hey, I really don't like y'all, but God said, it. you know, just real kind of low key, soft voice, pathetic, hoping that God would fry him. And uh, it never happened. They all heard him and fell to their knees. And remember, that was the story where the king uh, even had the uh, the sheep and the goats and the cattle covered with ash cloth and, and uh, ashes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, as a sign of repentance. And Jonah was basically very disappointed. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> um, so Balaam, there's a story about Balaam riding a Tonkin donkey. Uh, Hosea married a prostitute and named his kids weird names. Ezekiel ate a scroll as a part of uh, his pronouncement of following God's prophecy to the people. Kind of like the dog ate my homework. He ate, he ate his stuff. I don't know. So, and yeah, this is all. I wish y'all were watching me because I have like a thousand sheets of paper in front of me right now. <laughs> and these are all specific things that the Bible says God asked these prophets to do. Yeah. Like God asked Yeah, this wasn't Ezekiel something they thought they would do. Scroll. Yeah, no, this wasn't like extra credit. Like, oh, I know what. I'll do this. No. This was all a part of the plan that, you know, they said to do. So with things like that, do we ever learn like why, like what the benefit was to doing mm. those things of like the eating of the scroll or things like that. And we later find out in the story, oh, it, it turns out that, you know, scroll is great for your digestion. <laughs> like, what, right. what, what do we know? Y- yeah. Because it just sounds to me like it's crazy story after crazy story that we don't quite understand. And it's kind of like everybody's got that weird person in their family. In my family, I'm the weird person. And so like, if I do something, Stephanie is like, Oh, well, that's just Alyssa. Alyssa. Like, "Ah, it's just Alyssa being Alyssa, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of thing. Is that the way that these prophets were viewed of like, Oh, it's just Elijah being Elijah. Well, (laughs) the interesting thing is we don't get the footnotes of that. There, you know, there's not, like, wouldn't that be great? I think you and I have always thought we, if, if we had the Bible to rewrite, we would make it a lot more interesting. Like, uh, here's what he said. Then there wasn't a column over here what that said, oh, here's what people heard him thought or did or whatever. It's just. Here's how everyone reacted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, here's what he said and here's what he was told to do. In some cases, it's interpreted, but not very often. Mm. I know. Uh, I'm trying to find the deal about why uh, there was there has been at least in commentary today some uh, some document not document some deep thinkers about what was the symbolism of the excrement. Why well, go bake bread over human excrement? And I they, don't know if you've mentioned that story yet. So. Oh, <laughs> that, I thought I would just <laughs> drop that in there because um, that was Ezekiel as well, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, get, tell us tell us about Ezekiel. Let's focus on him for a second because he has a few weird things. He does that he does that I don't quite understand. All right, what so, we're supposed to learn. All from right, them. Ezekiel, if you're following along in your Bible, uh, okay, does it just bore people to death if I read to him? And so in Ezekiel, I, if you're four, reading the Bible, people aren't allowed to say they're bored. Oh, that's right. Okay, it's a rule. So in Ezekiel four. It's a good one. Like, read this tonight before bedtime. Um, I'm going to just read a bit of this because it's all what we're talking about. Uh, now, son of man, this is Ezekiel. Take a block of clay, put it in front of you, and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Then lay siege to it. Erect siege, erect siege works against it. That doesn't make sense. Build a ramp up to it. 
Uh, then he says, then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you shall bear the sin of the people of Israel. Okie doke. After you have finished this, lie down again on your right side. And, but on, so on the right side, he only has to lay there um, 40 days. So I don't know what um, the sin of the people. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. The sin of the people of Judah. So Judah didn't sin as bad as That's the other Israel. people. He only got 40 days for that. And then it says, it's verse 9, take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt. That's a thing. Put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side. So you do get time off to cook. Weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Um, eat the food as you would a loaf of barley bread. Bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. The Lord said, in this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. Okay, so getting the people of Israel's attention, I would perhaps think that maybe he's like, hey, you don't want, you don't want to have bread cooked over poo, so straighten up. I have questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so is the thought that like, the community is watching him do all of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they're saying, so they're watching him doing this, knowing that he's taking the punishment of their sin. Yes. That's a great way to put it. Okay. And part of that punishment is eating bread cooked over a poo poo fire. I know, but listen, I, I, I uh, he made a deal with God. So, um, then I said, the, the um, prophet, not so, sovereign Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to use that line. <laughs> not so, sovereign Lord. I have, that sounds like a Batman statement. I have never defiled myself. From my youth until now, I have never eaten anything found dead, roadkill, or torn up by wild animals. No impure meat has ever entered my mouth. Very well, he said, he being God. I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human dung. Oh, well, that was nice. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, so that's Ezekiel. That's, um. Okay, I think that that's a weird one. Well, we, <laughs> okay, but hold on. Do we have a, someone we, who tops Ezekiel? No, but I, I found the one about eat the scroll. Oh, that's also Ezekiel. Ezekiel 3. Okay. So. Okay. I'm, I want to go read all of Ezekiel now. Ezekiel 3, he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. See, I guess the issue that I have with all of this is I don't know what we're supposed to learn. I know from I'm these. looking. I don't either. Like I, I struggle with it, and I'm not trying to be um, obtuse or uh, irreverent, but it just I wonder about like profit uh, versus mental illness. So here's what I'm thinking. We probably should have started reading Ezekiel at chapter one or two, because now that I'm back to two, uh, he, God, said, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the spirit came into me, Ezekiel, and raised me to my feet. And I heard him saying to me, he said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. And then he goes on and on and on. So one of the things I don't, maybe I just hit it lightly and went on, is uh, that was a big uh, message amongst prophets, calling out people and their rebellious spirit. Mm. And so a uh, prophet would be sent into that population. I mean, that's the whole story of Jonah, right? Go in, tell them to straighten up, 
or this will happen. You know what? That actually starts to make more sense of like all of the crazy things. So if like the point of the prophets Mm -hmm. is to quell a rebellious spirit, then by example, they're going to show themselves obeying the most outlandish requests from God to show what it is to be obedient. Well, yeah, maybe just to drive home the point and maybe... Like no matter what God asks you to do, you should go do to it. that and you have to, to change. You have to stop rebelling against the spirit of God. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I guess like... Could there have been another way to do that? Like I know. I don't know. Well, and was that, um, I don't know how to say this, was that a writing or speaking style in that day, you know, uh, rather than just a TED Talk about straightening up your act? Was that, was that language, was that demonstration? Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of like... Like you said, does that get their attention on the midway? I mean... Well, and I I guess I understand it. Like, looking at it in today's context, we have so many people who are educated and uh, under a certain topic, and they try and call out society and say, hey, we're doing this wrong. We're approaching this wrong. Here is all of the evidence that shows like we're going down a dangerous path. And so they lay out all of the facts. They lay out all of the information and nobody listens. Nobody cares. It just becomes white noise and they just get tired of hearing about it. But if you see, I mean, it, it feels akin to Monk's setting themselves on fire in form of protest of like that has always really sat uneasy with me of why, why would you do that as a form of protest? Like, is this worth sacrificing your life? Is this worth the most pain that I could ever imagine? And there's a chance that nothing could change. I guess if you are, um, I don't know the word that comes to mind says zealot, but I don't know that that really fits. But if you're so, emotionally invested in somehow capturing, you know, what would nowadays be what, 15 seconds on the news, maybe mm-hmm. of, um, and you, you know, you feel that strongly about it. You're willing to die for it. And maybe that's in part, you know, we have different ways to, uh, put that out there nowadays, but it's our lens of uh, humor and a little bit of judgment about these guys. Um, uh, and I don't know. I kind of think maybe some of the authors might have jazzed this up a little bit, but that's for another day because then that'll mostly, open up the whole I Bible mean, thing. It, it's I don't know if it's judgment as more of it's like curiosity and confusion of like I am just beyond confused of especially with like one of our core values at this church being biblical relevance. I'm like, okay, I don't get how the actions of these prophets are relevant to me. Like I think of the story of Elijah sicking bears on children Mm -hmm. or on teenagers because Mm -hmm. they called him bald, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's just that little snippet of story. If you read all, I think it's in second Kings. So if you read second Kings, there's a little snippet that's literally like a couple of sentences that come out of nowhere of Elijah was walking down the road. Teenagers uh, came up around him and said, we're taunting him saying, go on, you bald head. And he turned around and smited them. And like mm-hmm. bears came and ripped them apart and, and murdered these teenagers. And I'm just like, And then it moves on to the next part of the story. And it's just like, and then he arrived at his location. And I'm like, wait a second. Yeah. What, what, (laughs) like calling on the power of God to murder teenagers because they called you bald? Like, I don't get it. I don't understand, like, what. I agree. What is God trying to communicate um, to us today? (laughs) Is there a chance that everything is not a part of a communication for today? Is there, like, when, to use the word relevant and, and to use um, biblical relevance. So at first blush, is that saying every word in the Bible is relevant for interpretation for today? 
Or can you, is it more of a like, you know, what's that phrase, a 30,000 foot well, view I, I and look down and look at the, that, the span of the yeah. biblical story is relevant for today? Oh, yeah. Maybe because it's, it's about finding truth in scripture that stands the test of time. Well, okay. So we have all of these prophets who mm-hmm. do crazy things that just don't make sense. And so when we look at it in a micro view, we're like, okay, I don't see the truth in this. However, all of these prophets were a huge part of building and maintaining the Jewish faith and the Christian faith. Like when we step into the New Testament, we have John the Baptist who wore a sackcloth and ate locusts. There you go. Like (laughs) that's pretty odd behavior as well. Um, And he is like a huge builder preparing the way for Jesus. So why do we have these little details? Like, do they matter? Are we supposed to learn something from these odd details about the prophets? Well, the the only thing that comes to my mind is all of these little details, you or I would look at and say they're pretty extreme, right? Maybe it is an illustration of a bigger point about a person's willingness to go to whatever links. Uh, now, you know, I don't know what I'm about to say for sure, but I, I mean, the the fact that they pointed out that he ate locusts, right? Um, a lot of people in the world eat insects. Yeah. So maybe uh, it wasn't as weird as we exactly. perceive it to be. We're now. looking at it through our lens of eh, maybe. Um, I don't know. So, I mean, the, the, the curiosity is, why did that make the cut in the story? Yeah. What What was the writer trying to prove? Mm-hmm. I do think he was trying to prove something because he made a big point of saying, here's what he wore and here's what he ate. Otherwise, that's not really mm-hmm. noteworthy. You don't get people's wardrobe and their diet yeah. in the well, story. Yeah, and I guess that's what made me assume it was out of the ordinary since it's mentioned. But, you know, now when I go back and think of Ezekiel, yeah, well, the laying on your side for that long is a little so, odd, but like the the cooking your bread over cow dung, not that weird because cow dung and cow patties are used like in native fuel. cultures, indigenous cultures yep. for fuel. And they are a part of making a fire and keeping a fire burning for a long time. And so oh, yeah. like in Africa, when we were walking around like uh, picking up elephant dung was a big deal because elephants eat such huge amounts of wood that even when they poop it, you you get a lot of kindling. Mm. You know, so that's a great fire starter. So, and Ezekiel was like, "Okay, you asked me to do human poo, but that's a little too weird for me. <laughs> Can we just keep it normal? Can yeah. we do the cow poo? Sheep and cow poo. Yeah." And so I'm like, oh, "Okay, like, mm-hmm. but why did God ask him to do the human poo?" <laughs> Like, I, don't I don't know. know. You know what? Somebody who's listening, go back and research. I'm I'm fairly certain, too, there is something about your right side and your left side. Yeah. It, strangely, I, so I'm a, every time lately I go to the doctor, they're like, are you a side sleeper? I'm like, well, I think during the night, yes, I might. I, I, I'm an everything sleeper. Uh, but then I saw this graph about certain organs that like align when you're on your left side. Certain things happen in your nutri- in your dietary system, your whatever, when you lay on your left side. So maybe back in that time, there was real importance behind, you know, your right and your left. Back in that day, uh, there was one hand that was used to clean up after things, and I think that was the left hand. So you know, that was a side that was not highly regarded. So who knows? I mean, gosh, you know. Need- and that's what I wonder about is like, are there hidden messages in here that we don't understand today that the people of the time would have understood exactly the symbolism of, like you said, of him laying on his right side for that period of time and then switching to his left side and all of this stuff. They're like, oh, we know what this means. And we're going back reading this and we're just like, what a wackadoo. <laughs> I bet. You know, I, so I think there is a, um, a profession called a biblical archaeologist. We need to find one of those and bring them in here. And um, so, okay, an archaeologist would help find it. Do they help find the meaning behind what they find? I don't know. Any of y'all archaeologists, let us call in, even though you can't really call in. (laughs) Maybe Um, someday. So another fun one, Ezekiel, 
we should do a case study on Ezekiel because here's another funny thing he did. He um, to warn the people of their impending destruction, he cut off his hair and beard using a sword. He burned a third of it, threw a third of it into the wind, and hacked the remaining third to pieces. He only saved a few hairs in his garment. Why? So what? It, why did it say he did that to warn people? To warn the people of their impending destruction. Oh. Mm-hmm. You know, I was actually reading uh, something. I don't know if it's true or not, but <laughs> so why not just put it on a podcast? Put it out there. Um, but it was a re- really interesting thought, even if it's not true, of this idea it, that uh, leaders in time of times of peace have long hair and in times of war have short hair. And so it's like this thought of like there were certain... Uh, ancient civilizations that they would declare war by cutting off their hair and sending it to the person that they were declaring oh, war against. Oh, that was like a shot and across the, the bow. the idea was of. that the longer the hair is of the person who sent it, the more meaningful it is because a person with extremely long hair is patient, peaceful, and Look tries how long to they've been living war. in peace. Look or, how long they've yeah. been living, living at peace and they yeah. chose to go to war with you. And so it's I kind of that. an interesting, I don't know if it's true, yeah. but I was, it kind of piqued my curiosity. And uh, I was like, oh, I wonder if it has something to do with that of like cutting your hair is a declaration of war. Some, maybe. Who knows? I want to read you another funny story about Ezekiel, okay? So uh, just here's commentary from the internet. Ezekiel himself was among 10,000 Jewish captives taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. He was from the tribe of Levi. God called him to be a prophet around 593 BC. Ezekiel is also, he had trances. He had a trance and visions of wheels with eyes, four-faced creatures with human hands and wings, and strange crystal architecture in the sky. Uh, It has been seriously suggested that he suffered from schizophrenia or some other form of psychosis. See, that's what I was wondering earlier of like Mm -hmm. how much of this, because I'm not, I'm not here to say you can't have mental illness and be called by God. Of course you can. can. Um, But I just, it, I don't know. It just opens up a huge can of worms for me of, um, because I don't want to discount yeah. what they did and their role in the formation of the faith. But looking back on it with modern eyes brings up a lot of questions. Well, so we have to own that like we look at it through these uh, this lens thousands of years later. Our inclination is because it's weird, it's wrong. And we're not saying that it's not wrong. We're just swept away by mm-hmm. its weirdness. And trying to figure out how the God of the universe thought that might be a helpful teaching tool. And we're stumped, God. Mm-hmm. Right? So, you know, whether it was to get people's attention, um, you know. So one thing I read said, uh, it was, the stories usually serve to remind Israel about their special pact with God. If Israel remained loyal to God, they would enjoy his blessings. And protection. If they betrayed him by serving other deities or oppressing vulnerable people, God would judge them more harshly. So um, maybe some of this is just the willingness people are go are the willingness people have to go to whatever links, and even some of those links, like you're just saying, might be symbolic that we don't understand. Uh, somebody does maybe. Uh, in denouncing, I mean, think about what, like you said a minute ago, about there have been people who have been known to uh, alight themselves on fire. Mm-hmm. What are other links people are willing to go to today to denounce oppression and injustice? We have um, a fast, or uh, that's not the word I'm thinking of. Like when you go without food for a long time, you are, what's that called? Besides fasting, hunger strike. Hunger strike, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have that. Um, I mean, other people do things like green, the green cause. What's that? They go out in smaller fishing boats and go right in front of uh, Japanese whale tra- uh, trawlers mm-hmm. and risk, you know, just getting run over by a huge ship. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think even 
participating in the right to protest. Like mm-hmm. you're taking your life into your own hands mm-hmm. uh, by doing that, even though it's supposed to be something peaceful and something that's very much allowed. Uh, it's often met with violence and um, you just, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, Nowadays, when you stand up against people, uh, especially in some of the situations we're aware of lately of racism and uh, gun violence, when you speak out against those who appear to be for that, uh, there's a, some uh, extremism yeah. that is pretty scary. Yeah. I mean, think back about what happened to the young black Americans in the late 50s and 60s. They were met with billy clubs and water cannons and they would get beat up. And, um, you know, basically they were speaking for the right to ride on the bus and sit and at the And there might have been countertop. a lot of people who were like, y'all are crazy. Why are you doing this to yourselves? Like, yep. just maintain the status quo and live out your life. Just and get along. Uh, there, everyone's like, no, this is worth my life. Like, this is worth mm-hmm. uh, giving up what I need to. So um, if you're thinking that you're um, the spokesperson for God and you care so much about your village, you might just be willing to go to any length. I mean, we see that in those situations, right? And so the links that we see that made uh, that recorded in the Bible— we can't get our head around, whether it's food, weird things, or, you know, uh, other actions that they did. Uh, we don't get it. Well, here's the thing. Tell I me the thing. have yet to come across somebody who claims to be a spokesperson for God that I believe is a spokesperson for God. Because mm-hmm. I think for you to say, I am a prophet, I am a messenger of God, like, so there's a level of arrogance in there for like, I don't know. I feel like the people who are true messengers of God are much more humble, but mm. is that, I don't know if that's true either because the prophets don't seem to be that humble from the Bible. They seem to be like outlandish personalities. And so like, I'm wondering, do they have like the outgoing, weird personality and then God calls them or does God call them to do weird (laughs) outlandish things that they don't want to do? Does getting getting called by God make you weird or being willing to do weird things? Yeah. Or are you just a weird person? (laughs) And weird meaning you have, you do some things, funky things. (laughs) I'll fix that one. (laughs) You could do those things as well. Uh, And... That's, you know, that kind of extremism. You know, here's what I'm, here's the stuff that we don't know about happened during Bible times. Like, so um, were there other prophets who were the quiet, gentle kind that weren't going to big extremes, but Mm -hmm. were saying, hey, y'all, you know, we really need to do this, or we really need to change our ways, or we really need to. I want to hear you talk about the female prophets. Oh, I don't have much about them. Probably because mm-hmm. they, didn't they get might have been exactly to. what you just described. Because I think of, okay, so we have this beautiful story in the birth narrative of Jesus. Um, Anna, the prophetess, who um, I it's Anna and Zechariah. It's after Jesus is born mm-hmm. and they get to see Jesus and Zechariah says like I can die now God had told him he would live until he saw the Lord and he said now I can die and Anna got to I guess she had been prophesying about the coming Mm -hmm. of Jesus and she got to see him and hold him but that's really all we know about her um is in that moment. But for her to be, we know that she was in old age. The community referred to her as a prophetess. So my guess is she had been prophesying and teaching for years and years and years. And yet we know nothing about her except she got to hold the newborn baby Jesus. And I just imagine like there are all sorts of prophets who weren't, uh, out of the ordinary enough to be written about. All right, I'm going to hit you with some. You ready? Okay. Bible study tool says, yes, there were female um, prophets. Is there a difference between a prophet and a prophetess? 
Why can't they just use the gender neutral profit? I know. Profit? Like the word profit is not a masculine word. Exactly. Just call everybody a profit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Miriam, Deborah, Holda, Anna made the cut of... Uh, Miriam is named a prophet or prophetess in Exodus. She led the women in worship after Israel crossed the Red Sea. Oh, I didn't know that. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Deborah, uh, the Lord spoke through Deborah. She pronounced God's command to Barak to lead Israel's army to fight against somebody else. Um, She was also a judge in Israel. Judge Deborah. Huldah, uh, God used her to convey a message to Josiah, the king of Judah, Demonst- uh, got, getting unto them for their sins uh, over Israel. An unnamed prophetess. Uh, Isaiah's unnamed wife was also a prophetess. She bore a son to Isaiah named, oh my goodness sakes, Mahir Shalal Hashbaziz. If you want to look that up, look in Isaiah 8, 1 through 4. Now, that makes me kind of sad. Isaiah's unnamed wife. Mm. There are a lot of unnamed women in Scripture. Yes, there are. Philip's daughters, the role of the prophets waned during the early church. I mean, they were probably doing a bunch of other crap. A few prophets stood out in their later years, including Philip's four daughters. Wow. Do we know their names? No. Nope. (laughs) They didn't make the They don't get names. No, but, you know. So close. So close. Their daddy made the cut, but they didn't. Well, okay, so here's what I want to— But that sounds like the women were just doing, like, Normal talking type things of like, mm-hmm. oh, God gave me a message to send to these people. Let me go tell them the message sort All right, of thing. So let's just take this to a little extreme for a minute. So the men would go into the town square and do their thing. Mm-hmm. The women uh, were also uh, harvesting, cooking, cleaning, doing all those things and prophet- and prophesying. Yeah, prophesying. prophesying. Um so, you know, maybe you prophesy in a little more normal way at the well than you do Ezekiel down on the town square eating lo- locusts or crickets or whatever, you know? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I hate that because it makes it sound like women, uh, I'm relegating women to these chores, but we do know that that's pretty substantiated, that they... they. But I don't think that we've done, I don't understand the life of a, a female prophet. Like, what if their lifestyle is completely different than other women? They were treated yeah. differently by the community or they were, I don't know. Well, the one, the, you know, the intimation was she was held up and respected and she became a judge. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so, Deborah was a warrior. Yeah. So, again, surely it wasn't that the people who put the Bible together slighted them. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Never. <sighs> so Daniel and I were talking just a little bit ago. If y'all don't know him, he's our senior pastor. And I said, so who makes the cut today as a modern prophet? And we talked in different arenas like religious prophets, um, socioeconomic, uh, third world country, climate, you know, and different things like that. And he mentioned a guy named Brian McLaren mm. who is um, – I think he has his roots in like traditional uh, Christianity seminaries and academia, but has kind of gotten brave of late to go off and both call out the church, uh, big capital C church denominations on how they're um, losing people. Uh, Richard Rohr. Yeah. A whole lot of people who have begun to talk about uh, uh, Eastern religion meeting uh, Western religion, mysticism, mm-hmm. uh, any of the other kind of uh, non-traditional realms of experiencing the holy. Rachel Held Evans, uh, I think, was... See, so what, again, what makes a person, does it, just because you're a good author, does that make you a prophet? No, Not, I think Nadia it's... Nadia Bowles-Weber? That's, that's why I have the, the litmus of speaking truth to power. Okay. If you're willing to take on the powers that be... And set and point a finger and say, "Hey, y'all need to change the way you're doing things." I think Nadia Boltz Weber is a great example. Mm-hmm. I think she's ever y'all should y'all should look into her if y'all um, haven't heard of her. And the same with Rachel Held Evans. I think Nadia Boltz Weber just you know in part she's kind of an extreme looking person because she's you know uh, on any given day her hair is any given color and she's piercings covered and tattoos. covered in tattoos yeah. and uh, but came out of I think the Lutheran Church. 
maybe? I think so. She's a woman after my own heart. I love her. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I want to believe that there are people today speaking for God and are calling out ways that um, perhaps are a challenge to the status quo. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that the the issue is— there are so many people claiming to speak for God and everything is so easily accessible while in scriptural times, it's basically like you're in this little community. Mm -hmm. If there's someone in that community that claims to speak for God, like that's an anomaly or someone who comes through town and claims to speak for the, it's not something you're hearing all the time, but I feel like we're constantly hearing people saying they're speaking on behalf of God. They are God's messenger. They're this, they're that. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know about that because it's not like, I don't even have the chance to get to know who this person is because my guess is the prophets in the Bible times, they were embedded in the communities that they were speaking to. They knew each other on a personal level. They had friendships. They had families. They had people surrounding them that truly knew them. And so I don't like the idea of watching a televangelist on TV claim that they're the messenger of God. You've never met them. You know nothing about them. You have zero relationship with them, but you're just supposed to accept that they're a prophet. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I think that there is. Um, let's see what, how, what all we can agree on here. There are many men and women who say they speak for God. There are many who use uh, huge forms of media, TV, internet, you know, the whole, all the tools, all the bells and whistles. There are many who um, ask for money who are doing that. There are many who have uh, benefited greatly from doing that. And so I think you have to, kind of create these checkoff lists. Like, um, I'm not against them making, well, raising funds that are equally distributed amongst all. Mm -hmm. I don't think that entitles them to a jet or a mansion or five cars or, you know, custom made clothes. Yeah, because at that point, you're not speaking truth to power. You are the power (laughs) at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I think that it's challenging. It would be interesting, and I think you and I should do this, we should create the checklist for who are modern day prophets. Mm. We're both we're smart. We can come up with this. So the the um, New York Times says that Christian prophets are on the rise. Sit on that for a minute. But uh, <laughs> so prophets, they have uh, we have uh, lifted up their message and put it in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. We continue to read it and study it today, and we apply it to our understanding of God and God's uh, relationship to us, um, is there any chance there aren't prophets anymore? I don't think so. I mean, I think that, so within our church, one of the things that we do is we put a big emphasis on spiritual gifts. And one of the spiritual gifts that we say still exist today is prophecy. And, um, there are people, well, honestly, I'm one of the people who I have the spiritual gift of prophecy. Now I know it's insane. Now it's not my highest spiritual gift. And I'm not here to tell you I'm a prophet because I run away from that title. Like you wouldn't believe, (laughs) um, because I just don't, I just don't know about that. My, my top spiritual gift is discernment. Uh, But prophecy is in the top three. And I do think that there are, I I think of um, Pastor Rachel Griffin at Oaklawn. Um, I think of her as a prophet. Like, I think that she sees the direction that the church is going in. And she puts a lot of warnings out to people of like what's happening. And I, the way that she preaches, um, is I I think in a very prophet leaning type way, so I do think that there are prophets among us today, and but I don't think that they're the people who are shouting at you that they are a self proclaimed prophet. Yeah, um, I think that it's much more subtle than that. And but of course, of course, God is still using people to be messengers of God, like. 
why would that be limited to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago? Sure. You know, no, there will that. always be messengers uh, who represent the heart of God. So I'm looking down here because I knew Jesus called out and talked about false prophets. In Matthew 24, he says, then many false prophets will rise up and will deceive you. In Matthew and uh, Luke both, he warned his followers about wolves who would be openly hostile and um, wolves described as sheep. Mm. And beware of false prophets disguised as sheep who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Hmm. This one guy, uh, I, you know me, I love a good template. Signs of a false prophet. False prophets may make predictions that do not come true. False prophets may perform miraculous signs and wonders. Okay. False prophets may claim to be Christ. Ooh. False prophets may have an unbiblical lifestyle. We talked about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. They may deny Christ's identity, may lead people away from the Lord. And uh, he uh, put together this whole list of things to be on the lookout for. They make promises they can't deliver. They speak more evil than good. They use alluring thoughts to provoke attention. They make grandiose promises but never live, uh, deliver. They're out for monetary gain. So That's a lot. Yeah, that I can get on board with all of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, this is interesting. When they prey on unstable new believers, or I would just say they prey on anybody and are uh, un, especially unstable people. So... Mm. Um, does so it, I think that I would definitely stay, say there are still false prophets among us today. <laughs> and oh, I, think I think a the big world part is, of that is like people who misrepresent Christ, but claim to be the voice of like to represent the voice of God. But at the same time, they're not living the life that they should. They're not treating the people the way that they should. They are inciting other people. And it just, it, it, it all falls apart. So if there are false prophets among us, my hope is that there are still true prophets among us who can help us get out of this mess. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it's really important. Maybe we talk about this on another day because false prophets are profiting off of their false profiting, mm -hmm. uh, making a ton of money, abusing people. Uh, there are some that are cultists, who uh, do sex trafficking and do all sorts of other extreme lifestyle behaviors and victimization of folks all under the name of that they're, you know, the uh, preaching the gospel yeah. or the voice of God or, you know, bringing a message. And if that intersects with you at your most vulnerable place in your physical or mental health, um, you know, look out. So, do you feel like you've personally known any prophets? Mm-mm. No? Oh, no. No. I don't know. I mean, I think that I've known a lot of people who speak and preach in a way that calls out human behavior. But I don't know that I, that, that rises to the level of being a prophet. Mm. I don't know. That's a good question. See, I'll that's have what to I wonder about that. is, like, is prophet this, like, big title that you have to be a certain level of importance to receive? Or... Can anyone be a prophet who is in tuned with the spirit of God and God calls? So like we, we want to think of it as this elevated position among us mm -hmm. when really what it might be is just anyone and, and everyone has that. Well, to your I mean, the phrase you've said a couple of times, speaking truth to power. Yeah. Um, do you need a big, loud platform to do that? Or are you being prophetic when you speak truth to power that calls out, uh, you know, human victimization mm. or any of those other kind of traits? Um, Does it have to be in a mass media, mass communication setting, or can you just be having a conversation in a room full of people and calling out injustice in that room? Are you a prophet then? I think that the line of delineation maybe has something to do with are you ascribing what you're saying to God and to being illuminated mm -hmm. or motivated by God? Mm -hmm. 
That might be one of the, like, if we had to parse out a definition, I yeah. think we're going to need to get well, God in there Well, and that's why I run away from that. So when I did the spiritual gifts assessment um, and one of them came out as prophecy, I think that that has more to me, more to do with me being an opinionated and outspoken person than it does me listening for God to tell me how to communicate. Like, I don't feel yeah. like a lot of the conversations that I have are coming from God and God told me to communicate this to the people. Gotcha. And yeah, that's fair. But, but I have been told I'm someone who speaks truth to power, but I think that has more to do with I can't keep my mouth shut than <laughs> than God told me to do it. I will say in all of the reading I've just done over the last 48 hours, that was never an attribute of a prophet. Can't keep your mouth <laughs> can't shut. Keep mouth shut. <laughs> I think that's a great thing for us to end on is to think about who, where do you draw the line between a outspoken, um, challenging a uh, message, whether it's individually over a cup of coffee from a pulpit and a prophet who is speaking to a, a person or people uh, uh, on behalf of God. Yeah. And look up some of those weird prophets from the Bible and just have fun scrolling through those stories because they do get really unusual. But I think that one of the, I mean, one of the really great points that you brought up is uh, trying to look through it, not through our modern lens mm -hmm. and stop thinking of weird as wrong. Weird is not wrong. It's just different than what we come in contact with and what we see around us every single day. And uh, that's, that's what makes it so incredible is that God puts things in our path that we don't see every day to get our attention. Sure. And, and think about it through the lens of... Um, Maybe uh, it's what it took to get the attention of the listener then. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe it takes having a weird series in church today to get the attention of the listener. You know, I mean, if you think about it, we, we really, we strain our creative thinking caps mm -hmm. to imagine a way to present the gospel, the whole totality of Scripture in a way that people will, you know, what, give it another 30-second listen or yeah. something. And or even potentially want to explore it on their own. Like, how amazing would that be? Of like, people become curious. So here's what would, like, if you could take our last 24 months of worship series here and send them back to colonial times or to oh, no. people 100 <laughs> years ago and say, hey, can you imagine a prophet speaking any of this in the church? What would they call it? They would call us false prophets. They would call us false. And... Weird. Yeah, of course they would. And well, heretic. I would have been burned at the stake. You, well, probably but, so. Heretics, yeah. false prophets. Uh, man, imagine Williamsburg. They would, or uh, is that where they had like the, what was the city where they had the witch trials? Salem. Salem. Yeah, you would be drawn and quartered and gone, <laughs> gone. They would maybe use you to cook the bread over. <laughs> Ooh, that's a creepy thing to end on. <laughs> yeah, you have a great week too, Doug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The Life Plus God podcast is hosted, written, and produced by me, Alyssa Robinson, and sponsored by Treach Memorial United Methodist Church in Flower Mound, Texas. If you live in the Flower Mound area, I invite you to stop by and see if Treach could be your new church family. You can learn more about all of our programs and events at tmumc.org, and I hope to catch you next week for our next episode of the Life Plus God podcast.